Welcome back to the Wizards of Amazon podcast, your weekly blueprint for explosive success. I'm Carlos Alvarez, full-time successful Amazon seller and organizer of the largest Amazon seller meetup group in the world. Let's do this. Welcome to the Wizards of Amazon podcast, where we cover all things private label. My name is Carlos Alvarez, and I will be your host for the show. On today's episode, we have an aspiring Amazon private label seller, Chris uh, Cody. What's going on? Good morning, Carlos. How are you, sir? Awesome. We just went over the pronunciation of your last name, and then I'm right there at it. I'm like, I don't know if you heard the pause. (laughs) No worries. Cody, C-O-T-E or C-O-D-Y? Is it easier to remember it? Cody. Awesome, Chris. Uh, We... We met how? I was introduced to Gabriel, uh, at a who's part of your part of your crew, um, at a seller summit in Miami two years ago. He and I ended up in a mastermind session together, uh, befriended one another, had some things in common, and really, can really enjoyed the conversation. Um, we actually, you and I met um, out at a, a local bar that night, um, where I think you actually had a Wizard of Amazon meetup. Um, so brick somewhere in downtown Miami, I forget the, the specific location, but you and I met there first. Um, and then since then, I've been able to jump on some of your meetup calls, um, sitting in the back of the room, taking a lot of notes um, has basically been my role. But that's how you and I came came across paths. Awesome. I knew, you know, I knew about the the Gabe connection. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to start calling him the full Gabriel now. He's going to love it. So for anybody <laughs> listening to this, it's at paid by Amazon. Yeah, Gabe. We have to like message him after this and say, hey, you're going to be on the episode. But I knew Perfect. about the Gabe connection and I didn't know. And now it's coming back to me. Yeah, it was one of Steve Chu's Seller Summit events in, in Fort Lauderdale. And yes, so for the networking happy hour, exactly post event, right. I would host an Amazon seller meetup down there. Um, and the Zoom events you're referencing is is now that we're hosting our events on Zoom during COVID. Right. Yeah. One of the huge pluses there, host being able to have events in person and on Zoom is the ability to meet a lot of amazing people like you. Yeah. I mean, I, I had commented to Gabe I, at, the, at that point in time, I was traveling quite a bit and I said, I'll definitely come down and, and catch a meeting on Saturdays. And then, you know, business changed, COVID came, but I was so grateful that I was able to start attending these via Zoom. So in spite of what COVID presented in every other aspect of my life, um, I wouldn't have found my way here today had it not been for these conditions and circumstances. So I think it's been an excellent opportunity. Likewise. And speaking of being here today, um, I'm happy to say this is your first time guesting on a podcast and you're handling it like you got the Morgan Freeman voice going, like you're, you're doing great. Um, since, since other people have not had the privilege of, of, of knowing you or hearing your amazing voice on the podcast, um, can you introduce yourself? We're going to be jumping into like CPG and, and all this amazing stuff, but can you introduce yourself? Like how, what was your journey to Amazon like? Sure. sure yeah, that's, I appreciate it. So I am, as I described, on the third leg of my of my three legged stool career here. Um, I originally uh, lived in Boston. Um, my first part of my career was in retail. So I was actually working for BJ's Wholesale Club, which has a presence in uh, Southeast Florida. I was working in their corporate offices, uh, doing a in a roll around uh, what we would call today consumer insights or shopper insights. Uh, we called it member insights at BJ's because obviously the membership card. So I was working in a strategy role there. My um, I left that company 2007, um, and I hooked up with PepsiCo. So PepsiCo being the larger umbrella of, of a lot of companies that we're familiar with and brands in the CPG space. Um, that role, uh, after about 18 months, brought me to Chicago, where I've been since 2011 with my wife and son. Uh, I'm currently about 30 miles outside of PepsiCo. Uh, excuse me, outside of Chicago. Um, and from a PepsiCo perspective. Um, it was an exceptional opportunity, met some amazing people, traveled around the world, literally touched uh, a number of different corners of the world, uh, learned quite a bit about brand, about innovation, consumer insights, market insights, et cetera. Um, but after a while, it took a toll. Um, we were traveling three out of four weeks of the month, um, and it was to places like Sao Paulo, uh, Shanghai, Eastern, Western Europe, et cetera. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't necessarily around the country. So I took a toll for a while. Uh, after which I left PepsiCo in 2016, I think. Um, and I took some time off. Um, so I basically said, hey, you know what? I need to kind of um, replenish, regroup, recharge, um, spend some time with my son, who was five or six at the time. 
And uh, about a year after that, I got bored out of my tree. Um, and I kind of made two decisions at that point. Uh, I made a decision that I wouldn't go back to corporate um, and I would never retire. Like, I don't I don't understand how I could just sit around and, and golf or whatever. I mean, that's fun and whatnot. So I from there, from that position, I decided I got to try something. And I and I kind of migrated towards Amazon. Um, There's a little bit of a zigzag story between there, but that's where I ended up. I ended up selling Amazon retail arbitrage. Um, and I've graduated a little bit to that. Um sourcing wholesale. Um, but I'm at, as I said in the beginning, I'm at the beginning of my third stage of my career. And, and my goal here is to have some success in, in what I would describe as a larger umbrella of e-commerce. Oh, thanks for sharing that. You know, you something that I don't feel like enough people talk about is the experiences one has before they are introduced to Amazon and start selling them and, and start selling on Amazon and how that really influences or shapes um, their their path on, on how they approach Amazon. Like for somebody that is just a video nerd and they're constantly creating videos, they could crank out three amazing videos per day. They have YouTube experience working at another company. For them, if they were gonna start a private label product, it would make all the sense in the world to leverage that powerful experience that they have for, for their successes. What experiences do you feel you brought to the table in, in your Amazon business when you started? And can you clarify a little bit as to what your current Amazon business looks like? Yeah, of course. Um, so let me start with the current Amazon business. That's a little easier to describe. And then I can, I can back up to my experiences with probably CPGs, the most relevant. Um, so I started Amazon, like I mentioned, doing retail arbitrage, and I've since graduated, I, I've got my quotation fingers up, to wholesale. So what I do today now is I work with small niche brands, five to $10 million total enterprise, right? So these are the folks that are that are trying to break into Walmart, or trying to break into a Kroger, um, understanding they have to have some sort of an Amazon presence, but don't have the time nor the inclination or the knowledge to do it. So with a little bit of experience that I've had, my understanding of how CPG works, I'm filling a little bit of a gap for them to say, hey, I can manage your store. I'll take care of that for you. And in return, you'll sell to exclusively to me for your e-commerce needs. So I've started a little bit of a business around that. I have four brands that I'm working with now, um, and I'm kind of like pushing people off because it's not easy to scale um, the way it is. Um, so I'm trying to navigate that piece a little bit. Um, but that's effectively my role in, in Amazon today. My goal and where I think I have a little bit more of a strength based on my experiences, which, which I'll circle back to, is I'd like to get into private label. I think there's a huge opportunity around this notion of brand, around um, finding uh, niches and or sub niches inside of Amazon um, where, you can, where you can own a space. So some of the experiences I had at CPG, I think, complement that, right? So the role I was in uh, in a global strategy role was we were we were charged with basically building a number. We were trying to get to a value of sales. But... We were charged with identifying new markets, in this case, countries, new consumers and new needs um, to, to satisfy pain points, what we used to call pain points for them. Right. So understanding what the consumer segment is, understanding how they shop today, um, understanding what the competitive contact is. So how are they solving for their for their issue today and then designing innovation around that uh, under the notion of this brand halo that, that we would have in some of the brands that we worked with. That's very similar, my observations, to what folks are trying to do on Amazon today, right? You're trying to find a, find a niche. You're trying to do it a little bit better than the other folks you're listing against. Um, and you're trying to use whatever assets you have uh, in the form of brand or other um, to kind of beat your competition. So there are parallels, certainly, to the two roles. Um, the scale is obviously very, very different, right? And with that comes some pain points for me. You don't have access to a lot of the, the tools you had before. Uh, it's not easy getting data. Um, but the flip side of that is you can be much more strategically agile. You can make quick decisions, learn quick, fail fast. Um, and you don't have a lot of uh, stage gating and approvals and whatnot to go through. So uh, there are parallels unquestionably to how CPGs operate and how to develop and design a parallel, uh, excuse me, a private label on Amazon. The notion of the two the two paths are different in the sense of their volume and their scale. I would say, definitely a difference in uh, in scale. Yeah, no doubt. 
I want to, I want to, I want to make a confession here. The, and it's something I, I, you know, I've never shared this before. I don't think I've told my wife. I don't think I've told anybody. And that is when, when I first started selling, um, again, barely got my GED, dropped out of elementary school. Like just, uh, I think we have complete opposite paths as far as education when we started. Um, I, I sold, I got lucky and sold a business and I was around other people that I guess had money and they were educated and they had these 401k like jobs. And people would say stuff like oh, the CPG, my CPG company, and the, we're in the same vertical. And they, they would use these terms and I would just nod. <laughs> it was sort of like somebody that didn't speak a language and you just smile and you nod when they say something. And I just had the, I didn't have the foggiest idea. So just in case there is somebody listening to this that was in, is, is currently in the same position that I was and has no clue what a CPG is. Can you break down that? Because we're going to be saying that term uh, a lot. Fair, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so uh, a CPG is, is shorthand acronym for Consumer Package Goods Company. All right. I'll give you a, a couple broad examples of folks that everybody will recognize. Uh, Coca-Cola is a CPG. Uh, Samsung is a CPG. PepsiCo is a CPG. PepsiCo um, owns... I don't know, probably 40 brands, right? Everything from Mountain Dew to Tropicana, Frito-Lay Doritos, et cetera, et cetera. So those are CPG companies, consumer packaged good companies. Um, those are the folks, effectively, when you walk into center store at a Walmart, that's what you see very prevalent up and down the aisles are CPG companies. Okay, perfect. I, I wish I wish I would have known that many, many, many moons ago <laughs> in these networking events where people were just throwing this around and vertical this. And then I was just like, oh man, I am so not, you know, cut for this. So, so in fairness, and then in the interest of truth and in, 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 uh, full disclosure, I turned to someone at a conference two, two years ago, a year and a half ago and said, could you explain what a 3PL is? Because right? I had no idea what that was. Okay. We're even, we're even. Thank we've you. All, we're, we've all got some confessions. <laughs> Definitely. Um, tough question. With Amazon, there's a lot of different ways to uh, uh, approach this and be successful. But for you and with your past experience, and I'm assuming this this past experience in the in the CPG companies specifically is going to really determine your answer to this. Do you prefer getting into a private label product or, or brand that is very inch wide, mile deep, as far as like extremely niching down? or more of a mile wide inch deep, you know, you sell shower curtains, yeah. adult novelties, coffee projects, everything. What, what, what's your take on that? Yeah, that's, that's a, a fantastic question. So I'm going to preface it with uh, acknowledging your listeners, right? It depends what their goals are, right? So I, I have a, I have a point of view on this. I'll offer that in just a second. If your goal is to have an Amazon store, that's just creating perpetual revenue, right? Some sort of an annuity, if you will, um, you don't intend to sell it. You're not looking to grow an e-commerce outside in another channel. A mile wide and inch deep might be okay, right? You've got a, you know, a hundred hero items, as we used to call them, um, that are doing the type of volume that you're wanting. If your goal is other, meaning you want to design brands that you can sell into a, a Costco, a Dick's Sporting Goods, an HEB, a Publix, um, then my, my recommendation and, and the path that I'm going to take would be narrow and deep. Um, and the reason why narrow and deep is important is because especially when you're starting, your ability to use your brand and subsequently your brand halo becomes very, very important as you think about um, innovation, i.e. adding SKUs or adjacency categories. Um, and we can we can unpack that a little bit. But but net net narrow and deep is, is probably the best way to go. And a great example of why that's important is recently in the news, um, Coca-Cola. Right. Just cut 200 brands from their portfolio. So they were a mile wide and inch deep. They were covering more segments than they, than they could handle. Um, and I think what's important to remember in that scenario is every one of those brands, there's a new mouth to feed. Right. Or there's a new head cap count to manage or there's a new PPC can campaign to, to, to you know, moderate, et cetera. So Amazon cut their portfolio in half, literally in half for all their brands. My sense is they're they've got they got too wide and they're now focusing on their core competencies. I hadn't heard about you say so Coca Cola cut two hundred brands from their portfolio. Yeah, Coca Cola announced late October that they're cutting two hundred brands from their portfolio. Oh, and they haven't announced which brands they're going to be cutting. 
not as of yet. They cut a couple last summer. So they cut a Dwala, which was a, um, a juice drink, a vegetable juice drink. They cut Zico, I think, which was a, um, a water beverage. Um, and there was another one that a brand I didn't recognize um, when I read the article, but they had announced, they announced in late October, they're cutting 200 brands. Tab, Tab was one of them that they're going to end up cutting. And, and so, what, you know, go ahead. And what, how does, where does the benefit come in there? I, I think I know the answer, but I'm going to defer to, to what your uh, expertise says. So like what uh, you, you gave a, a, an amazing example also, maybe it'll complement this one in yeah. the, in the, in the Zoom networking event we did where I think you mentioned Quaker sure. required a certain X percentage of an ingredient across all products. Do you feel that Coca-Cola cutting 200 brands from their portfolio was sort of because they didn't do that? They strayed too far? My sense is, is that um, – so. So in the beverage business, um, it's it's a horizontal evaluation of categories, right? Or what we would call segments, all right? So there's like refreshing, there's morning, there's hydration, et cetera, et cetera. My sense is as they looked at their car competencies, right? Said, all right, where where's the growth? Where's the expense? Where are we putting our time? Um, and where do we think we can win share? Uh, and subsequently, how much would it cost to gain share and gain growth, et cetera? They probably evaluated some of these these segments, these verticals, if you will, and said, you know what, we we don't want to win here anymore, right? It's, it's it's it would cost us it would be disproportionate cost for us to have any gains. So that's my sense of what Coca Cola is doing, just based on having been in the business for a while and understanding how the how the cola wars and the beverage wars work. Um, from a Quaker perspective, to kind of flip that on its head. Um, from a Quaker halo, so Quaker is the Quaker Oats company based here in Chicago, right? So the oatmeal um, that you're familiar with, Larry is the logo. Um, they play in the morning, right? So they're a morning brand, right? Their halo is about nutrition. It's about goodness. It's about heart health. They feel they have permission, rightly so, um, to push and extend that out into other segments. So a segment here might be an adjacent category, uh, a nutrition bar as an example, or a snack bar. They feel like they have that because they have uh, ownership and they have equity and efficacy around that brand um, and around that that day part, right? So the morning, um, in, su in such a way that they feel that if they innovated in an adjacency like that, it's within their halo that they can they can get good rub off, if you will, of, of, their, of their master brand. You won't find, as an example, you know, giving extremes of, you won't find Quaker innovating at nighttime or, you know, post dinner snack or post dinner beverage, right? They have no equities there. Um, so they're going to stay within their core competencies, i.e. morning day part, wholesome, nutritious, and they're going to innovate as fast and as far as they can around that space. Wow. A a taking this to the private label, what, what, what would be some good examples there? I, maybe we could mess around with some of mine. The, and watch at the end of this, you're going to be like, Carlos, you suck. You know? yeah. <laughs> but like yeah. outside, outside of my, outside of my live insect brand, which is very unique. The, yeah. the majority of the rest of my products that I've just been extremely successful with uh, are in the ceramics space. And, okay. and let's say, you know, cheese boards and just all kind of you know, ceramic stoneware type of stuff. Yeah. Would, would that, would that be fair to say, really, that's my ceramics is more of my, my ingredient. And I'm more, since it's a cheese board, it's more in like the appetizer, uh, sub or like post meal niche. Yeah. Cause that, now that you say that, that is where all of my products technically fall is in that post meal mm -hmm. area. Are your, are your products branded? You have to the brand, but are absolutely. they branded? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I'll brand it. Yeah. So, so again, absent of, you know, absent of tipping the, um, the sand a little bit here, there's a lot of ways where you can look at where you can innovate and where you have permission to innovate. Right. And, um, you'll hear me, th you'll hear me throw out segments or horizontals or verticals. They're all just spaces, right? Day parts is another, is another nomenclature for these, these types of opportunities. Um, you could look at your space in a couple of different ways. You could look at your spaces as, um, are you hitting a sweet spot for uh, a consumer profile, right? So 
uh, I'm completely making all this up. Two income household with two kids that like to entertain that will pay a little more for uh, a quality product, right? That's a, a loosely interpreted consumer segment, right? And if that's the case and you have a clear understanding of who that consumer is, you could infer that that your brand would allow you to give them something um, for the morning occasion, right? So you're not necessarily innovating on a day part in that scenario. You're focusing on what the consumer likes. I like higher end. I like you know quality made. I like uh, I like the brand, et cetera, whatever the brand resonance and efficacy is. Another way to think about this is you could focus on day part, right? Just like you're just like you're describing, where um, after dinner entertainment is your space to innovate, right? So what does that mean? I mean that could mean plates, you know, that could mean the, the stuff that sits on the table, that could be the complementary pieces that are on the table. It could be um, it could be colors, like colors and, and um, different fabrics or different types of materials in an after dinner space. I think that space is probably a little wider, a little more opportunity for you. If you think about, I am going to innovate in after dinner entertainment. I'm, I'm generalizing the opportunity here. Um, but as long as you're delivering on your core competencies and your efficacy for the brand that you have now for the ceramics, you'll have permission to extend out into those spaces. They'll recognize you for delivering quality here. Why wouldn't I go with something over here? Is that fair? I was on mute. Sorry about that. <laughs> no I saw you panic. You're like reaching up for your for anyone not watching. Like, oh, you thought it was your headset. No, no. The I can see that. You know, I've not looked at it that way, but. Now taking taking a step back and looking at that 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 seems to be exactly what happened. And as, as we really built our base in a specific you know sub niche, we mm-hmm. then looked at others that still fell into let's just call it you know the post meal, yeah. and we we looked for what else was there because otherwise we would not have looked at that uh, yeah. to start. But um, no, that that's that's pretty amazing. So on Amazon. You know, you. I'm assuming you have not picked your your private label product yet. I have okay. not. I have not. I have not picked my space yet. To be candid with you, and that's that's something I'm struggling with. A couple of the questions that I've brought to you during the Zoom calls is, I come from a space of data, right? So give me the data so I can analyze it, or give me something I can analyze. Um, I find that um, trying to analyze an Amazon portfolio or a, or a store, if you will, is a lot harder. The data is not readily available, so I'm struggling with that a little bit. Um, there's other ways around that, but net net, I haven't picked my space yet. Um, and, and I'm completely open-minded to anything that's available. Sure. And, and, and fortunately now they have a ton of tools, which, you know, and I'm sure listeners, you know, the helium 10 viral launch yeah. jungle scout, all, all those tools yeah. that'll really give you really all of the data you're that Amazon is going to share to help you make an informed decision. The, at, when you do pick your product, and your niche, like how, how do you feel like you're going to approach that from, from what you've learned in your other companies? Do you feel like you're just going to say, Oh, you know, whatever helium 10 says, and then I'm just going to sell that one product. Or are you going to give some thought as to the complementary products in that niche that could go with it later? Yeah. So my, my plan is the latter of the, of the two that I described earlier. I don't think I want an Amazon portfolio of hero brands. Um, Cause I don't think there's an end game to that, or I don't think there's an extension, easy extension to that. I, I wholeheartedly feel like I'm going after a portfolio, right? So some 20, 25 SKUs, uh, if, if you will, around the brand uh, and perhaps, uh, you know, some of the adjacency categories. The, what, I, what I will do is um, I'll find a, I'll, I'll determine the means by which to niche down, right? I don't know what that is yet. Amazon, uh, excuse me, uh, Jungle Scout, Helium 10 are probably the tools um, that I'll use. You gave a great recommendation um, during the call. If you don't remember, you said just go into the store and stand in front of a category. Yeah. Right? Go go bay by bay and and ask yourself what you know, what you think you could do better. Um, so that's what I'll do. I'll end, I'll end up with a with a some sort of a category, a subcategory. My goal is uh, you know the next thirty to sixty days. Um, and the way I'll innovate is, and I don't know which which tier I'll take yet. Um, but with, we did this quite a bit at PepsiCo, and I think this will benefit uh, the listeners as well. So you've got these segments that you're working within, day parts, verticals, et cetera. It's all the same language. Um, so you're after dinner. Um, and I'll look at, I'll look to, stra- to a stratosphere of the category itself, right? So, and I'll characterize the products out there today as good, better, and best, okay? 
And depending on who's playing where and how I think they're delivering, obviously where the margins are and so on and so forth, I'll pick a space within that category that I think I can own. Um, my sense is, if you just looked at today, Amazon Basics, probably good, right? Maybe better, right? Maybe not quite best, right? There's a lot of folks out there that are selling high quality products with a great brand, great materials. I wouldn't necessarily characterize Amazon Basics as that. They're more of the Walmart, if you will. So could I go better or best in, in some of those categories? I think so, right? Um, and how you compete in that is is the quality of the materials, the branding that you use, the colors that you use, the efficacy that you're promising the consumers, et cetera. Um, and, and that's just a little forward looking. I don't know how that applies necessarily to the category I'm going to end, it, end up in. I'm just not there yet. Cool. That's fair. Um, just curiosity. So when you do pick your brand and you decide to sell it and with your you know previous experience and with the CPG, what what would off Amazon look like for you? Is there any experiences or exercises that you you went through in your you know previous career that you would apply here? So you're, talk, so you're talking about other channels. Is that sure. is that right? Yeah. Other yeah, other I mean, channels, I, social media, email marketing, content creation, branding. Yeah, I mean, I think I think D 2 C. If you're going to play today, and a lot of brands are building themselves on Amazon and, and direct to consumer, so D 2 C. Forgive me. Um, I think you have to play there today, right? There's there's a company out there that just a startup called uh, Italic. So it's kind of like the font that you find in in your Microsoft um, applications. Um, they're t- basically taking manufacturers and selling directly to consumers in the U.S. European manufacturers direct to consumers. So I think there's undoubtedly a trend heading in that direction. So I feel like you'd have to have some sort of a of a direct to consumer component. Um, I, I I view social and and some of the other tools as marketing inputs to that, right? So, you know, depending on where your consumer plays, so you, let's just, let's assume you have a little bit of a higher end consumer. That probably means Instagram more than it means Twitter, as an example, right? So. I think where you design your brand, um, the adjacent tools that you use to promote it are going to be complementary to whoever your end target is or what the brand efficacy is that you want to deliver the, to the consumers. I'm fearful of eh, – fearful is probably a strong word. I'm hesitant um, to start selling into brick and mortar. Um, just – I grew up there, right? Um, I grew up there from a retail perspective. I, I sold into there, if you will, from a CPG perspective – um, and I just I understand it. It's it's high volume, low margin. Um, you're dealing with you know a hundred different people that make di- different decisions about your product. If you're if you're selling across retailers, it's just a harder sell um, than if you were to try to directly engage with your own consumers, um, you know, via a Facebook group or whatever the case may be. Um, I feel like it's probably a little easier. If I were to pick retailers, I, I'd probably go volume first or something that's complementary um, to the brand that, or the category that I'm going to play in uh, crate and barrel versus uh, you know, a dollar store as a simple example. Awesome. Uh, la- la- last question. This just came up with, with something that you just said. Now the, when you were with PepsiCo and these other companies you're mentioning, it seems like only God has more money than them. <laughs> so, so it, how, how do you approach marketing and advertising. Just just keep spending and when we hit that number, we'll know. Whereas now you're not going to have those as deep, I'm imagining, pockets as, as PepsiCo. What how are you thinking about like what would you not do because budget doesn't permit and what would you double down on? That's a that's a fantastic question. Um <clears throat> so let me preface it with with larger budgets come larger expectations, right? Um, PepsiCo's, uh, when I left was about a $60 billion company, um, wall street expected three to 5% annual growth. So that's almost 2 billion in growth, right. Um, uh, every year. Um, so you had a budget to spend, right. You had margin to, you had margin, there's margin baked into those categories. You had, you had the money to spend, but it's a very, very tough deliverable, right? Like think about it. You're going to come up with $2 billion every year. Um, that's a high mark. That's a high watermark. I think down at the lower level at a private label, um, the expectations certainly aren't as high, right? Um, the growth is going to be probably stronger, but the, the spend is not going to be as much. I think the closer you can get to your consumer, um, the better value you're going to spend. You're going to get on your dollar, your return on your dollar. 
So if that means, you know, uh, Pinterest or if that means your own, uh, as I mentioned before, Facebook page, blogging, I don't know if that plays a role necessarily in the categories that you're in or where I'd end up. Um, but the long and the short of it is the closer you are to that consumer, the better ROI you're going to get. If you've got to go through three or four channels to get to them, um, for example, buying an end cap at Walmart in 3000 locations, right, um, which is a very real proposition for a CPG. Um, you're counting on your consumer to be walking in in that week to go by that aisle specifically to see your new product. And you're tr- trying to convey every message about that new product to them in a matter of five seconds or less. It's a hard proposition to deliver on. Um, whereas if you're a new new brand and a new consumer and you have a, a base of folks that you can speak to and that'll listen to you and advocate for you, I think the money and the return is going to come a lot easier in those types of situations. So the scale in that case works to your advantage. Chris, solid gold, man. You, you totally lived up to expectations on this. I, I want to be super respectful of your um, of your time. We yeah. covered a lot, and I feel like each point that we spoke on, we could have dove a lot deeper. But for time's sake, I wanted to uh, I, I wanted to cover what we did. Can you can you share any contact information that anybody listening to this could reach out to you on? Because you don't you don't have an agency yet. You have nothing to sell yeah. people, nothing no. like that. <laughs> it's a ton of experience that can help people out. Like, how can people get a hold of you? Yeah, I'm happy to. So you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Chris Cody, last name C O T E. Um, PepsiCo is my last uh, posted career there, so that's easy enough to find. Or feel free to email me. Uh, so it's my last name C O T E in Chicago. So Cody in Chicago at Gmail. Uh, and I'm always looking to network and happy to help wherever I can. Awesome. I'll have that LinkedIn uh, the profile link for, for your LinkedIn and your email in the show notes. Uh, Chris, before you escape and go on with your day, the question I like to ask all guests who are on the show, being an avid reader like I am, what was your favorite book you've ever read and why? So I've got quite a few business books that I like to read. Um, I, I enjoy books. There's a book out there about business model creation. It's a, it's a template. I, I use that quite a bit. Um, but interestingly, and in, in the time of year, it's appropriate. I've, I've got a book here um, called One Word. Right. So this isn't a business book necessarily. It's by a gentleman uh, named John Gordon. John Gordon. Um, and it's effectively a, a book about like how do you want to focus on? What's the one thing you want to focus on this year? And could you distill that down into one word? It's a very quick read. Um, it, you could probably read them in, in about an hour or two. Um, and I've gotten into a little bit of a habit. I'm hoping we, we're able to do it every New Year's Eve. My son and I read the book. And in the book, we write down what our word for the year is. Um, and we try our best to reflect on it halfway through the year and so on and so forth. So we'll actually read that book, this book, One Word, uh, this weekend. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, to spend a little time with my son to talk about uh, what's his gonna, one word going to be for, for 2021. That's awesome. So you read that book every year or this is the book you're reading this year? I read this book every year. Every every New Year's weekend, I read this book. Um, It's, you know, whatever, 45 pages. And you've been doing this for how long? Well, let's see. We've got three years in here now. So we we inscribe in the front of the book. Um, We inscribe in the front of the book what our one word for the year is. So he's 15. So we've been doing it since he was 12. That is awesome. That's amazing. Having a son and a daughter, I'm I'm hoping to you know, adopt those same, uh, customs with them. So I'm going to grab this book as soon as we end this here. Um, great. Chris, again, huge. Thank you for being on the show. I hope you, uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope everybody listening to this enjoyed it. And, um, I will let you go here. I hope to be, uh, talking to everybody again next week. Chris, you're amazing. I appreciate the support. Thanks for having me. Liked what you heard and want to stay connected. Join our Facebook group or find me anywhere on social media at Wizards of Amazon or text the word Amazon to 69922.